the, the Anglophone papers today. The Price of Truth is the Times front page today. And the editor, for who was, of course, Marie Colvin's boss inside, calls her one of the most determined and one of the most driven journalists he's ever met. Courageous, he says, she, sorry, he says rather, she had a tremendous joie de vivre and a profound rep belief that reporting from war zones could actually change something. He says in that piece, it's easy for journalists to become cynical and start to believe that their work has no effect on events in, if you like, the real world. But she had an enormous faith that reporting from war zones could in fact change real political events. That's what the Times editorial is talking about today. They say that all sorts of uh, horrendous things that have happened in the last 50 years, like the genocide in Cambodia in the 1970s or the Rwandan killings in 1994, at first seemed so barbaric that when the testimonies of victims were originally heard in the West, when they'd fled those countries, no one quite believed that they could be true. But without the work of reporters who were brave enough to go there and find out if they were really true and bring back evidence, we would never have known they were really happened and thus never have been able to take any action. In the Syria case, of course, if there were no reporters there, we would have no idea what is going on and therefore we wouldn't have a, sh a developing international consensus that Bashar al-Assad must leave. So her work, if you like, for those editors in The Times proves that journalists can in fact accomplish something really concrete the Guardian today also has republished an article written by Marie Colvin herself. It's the text of a speech that she gave in November 2010 at a Reporters Without Borders conference about why war reporting is actually important. She says there that over the last couple of years, the number of uh, reporters dying in war zones seems to be increasing. The incidence of them being deliberately targeted by, uh, by armies seems to be increasing. And that means it's more important than ever that people do actually go there and report. She talks about the era of 24-7 rolling news and blogs and Twitter saying that we often forget that despite all that technology, war reporting hasn't changed very much since she started it 30 years ago because you still need someone to actually go there and come back with the facts. Now, it wasn't just uh, Western or foreign or even seasoned journalists that died in Homs yesterday, was it? No, absolutely not. Look at this interesting article in the New York Times, which is about how, as they call it, the first YouTube war. They're talking about ordinary Syrian citizen journalists who risk their lives to go out, film what's happening, and post it on the internet. So that's something that new technology has changed. It now allows ordinary people, even in a city that's cut off like Homs is, to use the internet to make their um, what's happening to them public. They talk about... Uh, an some very well-known um, video bloggers in Syria who've been recently killed, um, like uh, Rami al-Sayed, who was found dead yesterday. His body was riddled with bullets after he had uh, spent 11 days broadcasting continuously what was going on in Homs on the internet. So he'd become already quite an internet celebrity and is now dead. So that's uh, something that's new about this conflict, according to the New York Times, just the amount of stuff that's appearing on the internet from ordinary people. Moving on to a different uh, story now, there's, of course, a leadership uh, challenge. Uh, there's going to be a vote on Monday in Australia between uh, Julia Gillard, the Prime Minister, and Kevin Rudd, whom she ousted in 2012. 2010, sorry. Yes, in 2010. The Independent calls this politics, the rivals, a political hate story. And they do go over the, ri the rivality between those two people. They do say that this conflict at the moment might have more to do with people within the Labour Party behind them rather than the two of them specifically wanting to attack one another. But they do say, note that it's ironic that when Labour came to, uh, first came to power in 2006, they were like a dream team, he as leader and her as deputy. Now they seem to have turned on one another. She, of course, carried out a coup against him in 2010. And now uh, he's going to attempt to carry out another one against her to replace her in the top job. They point out that more than anything this plays into the hands of the uh, Conservative opposition leader Tony Abbott who has written an editorial himself in the Sydney Morning Herald today saying that this uh, conflict and personal row going on within the Labour Party shows at least according to him that neither of them is fit to lead. I used to live in Australia and I'm hearing from a lot of people there that they're really fed up with all of this. We'll have mm -hmm. to see what happens at that vote on Monday. And finally, Italian politicians giving uh, other politicians around the world a lesson perhaps in trans transparency. Yes, according to La Repubblica, they've scored a world first. That's by publishing all of the tax returns of the current Italian cabinet in all their detail on the internet. The site crashed yesterday because Italians were so keen on finding out how much they earn. And what's surprising in austerity Italy is just how many millionaires there are in the Italian cabinet. The Justice Minister earned £7 million euros last year and she tells La Repubblica in an interview that she has no shame about that at all. Well I earn money she said I should be allowed to and she reckons you could build a hospital just with the taxes that she paid last year. All right thank you very much Elena for that. Look at the international papers. You're watching live from Paris a reminder